Whether it's light, dark, bottled, tapped, great tasting, or less filling, there's no doubt about it. America loves beer. Asking me what my favorite type of beer is is like asking me uh, which of my children I love the most. Beer is the number one selling beverage in the world, and in America, it outsells wine and liquor two and a half to one. From ale to stout, light beer to micro brews, our nation's breweries make more than 100 different styles of beer. Today, they brew it in state-of-the-art facilities, boasting everything from mills that hold more than 250,000 pounds of malt to 36,000 gallon temperature-controlled fermenting tanks. But these high-tech breweries are just the latest incarnation of an age-old practice. The history of beer goes back at least 10,000 years. Most anthropologists now believe that people went from a hunter-gatherer existence to a settled agricultural existence in order to have enough grain to make beer. We're not really sure where it started, but it was somewhere in Mesopotamia. Historically, what we call beer is an alcoholic beverage produced when sugars and malted grains are fermented by naturally occurring yeast. Because it was an additional nutrient source. It's really cereal grain that's been fermented. So it's additional carbohydrates, energy. It's unlikely that beer was a deliberate invention. It was probably discovered by accident when some yeast contaminated some cereal grain that had been spoiled by water. Maybe it was being used or prepared to make bread. Whatever happened, they liked the taste of it. Taste wasn't beer's only appeal in the ancient world. The Bavarians added an essential ingredient to the modern beer recipe. Wow. <laughs> Hops. Hops are a small, fluffy, papery green cone that contain aromatic substances Very fresh. and bitterness, which balances out the sweet maltiness of beer. Hops became a standard ingredient as beer spread throughout Europe, as much a part of everyday life as bread, and for good reason. Boiling beer during brewing kills off deadly microbes, but no one at the time knew it was the process of boiling that made beer safe. They didn't think to apply this principle to water. They attributed good health to drinking beer. Well water in many parts of Europe was contaminated. And beer, because the water is boiled, along with the barley and hops, before yeast is added, is sterilized. So it was a safe product. So it shouldn't be surprising that when the pilgrims boarded a ship in England in 1620 and headed for the New World, the hull was full of brew. It's axiomatic that we talk about uh, things that are very old in American culture as coming over on the Mayflower, and beer came over on the Mayflower. But it did more than just come over. Beer played a role in changing the course of American history. It's amazing how much brewing has had to do with our history right from the get-go. The Mayflower's destination was Virginia, but bad weather conditions delayed their landfall. With food and beer reserves getting scarce, they were forced to settle elsewhere. So the crew decided that they had to drop the pilgrims pretty soon because they feared that they would not have provisions, including beer, for the long trip home. So Plymouth was it. From day one, beer was vital in colonial America. Even though the water in America was pristine, old prejudices from Europe remained. They didn't trust water, but beer they could rely on. They knew that it was nourishing, they knew it was safe to drink, and it was an important part of their life. You drank beer from the time you got up in the morning until you went to bed, and that's men, women, and children. Most early colonial households brewed their own beer, a hearty brew for the adults and something called small beer for the children. Small beer was a style of beer which was made from a second rinsing of the same grain you had made some other beer with. So you can almost think of it as like reusing the tea bag to make weaker tea. Beers were taken for granted as a normal part of life, the way we think of bread or butter. With beer in such high demand, Quaker William Penn opened Pennsylvania's first commercial brewery in 1683 at his home 20 miles north of Philadelphia. Typical colonial brewery would be a small brick building 
Inside it, the primary piece of equipment would be a, uh, a furnace with a copper kettle on top of it. There would be a vessel for uh, holding the mash, which would just essentially look like a giant wooden laundry tub. In another part of the brewery, a room filled with wooden tanks that would be used to ferment the beer. And then in the coolest, darkest, dankest part of the brewery would be a series of barrels where the beer would be allowed to finish fermentation before it was shipped out to the taverns. By the late 1600s, breweries were popping up all over the country, from Rhode Island to Georgia, and so were the taverns that served their product. The tavern in colonial times was kind of all important. I mean, everything happened there. Usually when it got dark, people went to bed or they went to the tavern, where it was warm, all your friends were there anyway, they were burning their own coal in the winter time, which meant that you didn't really have to heat your house. It was the center of the community. And ale, a type of beer where the yeast ferments on top, was the staple of colonial taverns, but in a variety of styles. Well, during colonial times, actually, you had a lot of different types of beer. Uh, the most popular type of beer was called porter, which was a precursor to stout. You also had all kinds of wild stuff made from whatever was available. Pumpkin ale, for example, was really popular. George Washington was partial to molasses, brewing his own beer with the ingredient. During the Revolutionary War, General Washington took his dedication to beer one step further, ordering daily rations for soldiers to include one quart of beer per man. In the decades following independence, ale was on the decline. Patriotic Americans viewed the brew as something from their British past and drank whiskey instead. Never did have any use for the English. Beer in America looked like it might be on its way out. All that would change when a new wave of European immigrants hit the American shores. During the first half of the 19th century, some 500,000 Germans immigrated to the United States. And along with their favorite schnitzels, spätzles, and sausages, they brought their favorite style of beer, lager. The big difference between lager and ale is that the lager is fermented at cold temperatures. It's a longer, colder fermentation done by a different species of yeast than ferments ales. Lager beer uses a yeast that tolerates cold temperature very well. It does that at the bottom of the tank rather than at the top of the tank, which is why you see lager referred to bottom fermenting and ale referred to as top fermenting. The result of the cold bottom fermentation was a lighter, crisper beer. It was uh, light and clear and smooth and easy drinking and really quenched your thirst on a hot summer day like we have in North America. So lager beer was immediately adopted by Americans and almost overnight we switched from being ale drinkers to being lager drinkers. By the mid-1850s, lager had become popular with the German and British population, but lager was one high-maintenance beverage. It needed colder climates to be brewed at lower temperatures and kept on ice. Lager beer requires uh, fermentation at much cooler temperatures than ale, uh, down in the 30 and 40 degree Fahrenheit range. So brewers needed a way to keep the fermentation vessels cool. Where they could, they would burrow into the side of a mountain or find a cave. But until the advent of refrigeration, it was really difficult to make lager beer. The German lager makers set up shop up and down the Northeast, where the cold temperatures were most advantageous to brewing. This set the stage for a lager revolution that would storm the country. In 1990, a recipe for beer gleaned from the walls of King Tut's tomb was auctioned for $7,200.